Well, welcome to the 28th episode of Ideas and Lives. And today we're, my colleague Svi Bodhi and I are pleased to welcome Paula Hogan. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, the arc of her career and her ideas about uh, the world of finance and other issues. So take it away, Svi. Thank you, Bob. And uh, we welcome Paula. Now, I've known Paula, you know, we've known each other for a long time, Paula. Yeah. And you were the one who contacted me because you knew me through your father. There's an interesting connection there. I'll let you tell it because I, okay. I, I never remember it exactly. But uh, Paula is a professional financial planner with a rich history, uh, which we'll go through. So, and we have, you know, a usual set of questions, but that's just general guidelines. So, Paul, what were the most important influences on you growing up? Growing up, um, living in a loving family that valued intellectual achievement and living in a small community where everybody knew everybody's business. The kids where were not that? Chatham, New Jersey. My father commuted into New York. So, you know, we spent, we didn't have a lot of organized activities. We just ran through the backyards and had to be home in time for dinner. And the whole neighborhood knew it was going on. And that's a very rich upbringing, which isn't typical now. Not anymore, no. We, right. you, people are afraid. Yeah, well, I think technology has contributed to that. Um, I know we have four grown children and they all went to universities where they met people from all over the world and they all live in different cities now. And so it, it's a very different setup for how you have community. Well, what, fortunately how many, we have Zoom so we can- Yes. That's a, that's one form of community. You know, how when, many people um, were in your family? What's that? Did you have siblings? Yeah, I was the youngest of four. And my husband is also the youngest um, in his family. I think that does make a difference. <laughs> we had a lot more freedom. <laughs> yeah. Now, what your, how did your father get Find in touch you? with, he got in touch with me and then yeah. you found it. So let's tell that story. Um, my father was in touch with you. I think it was in the, probably the early eighties. Yes. When he was, um, uh, thinking a lot about commodities as being, a, um, a hedge for stocks. And I don't know how he found you, but every time he got off the phone with you, he said, that young man is so nice. <laughs> oh, that's nice to hear. <laughs> you were a young man at that point, and he was a newly retired person, and always trying to be careful about, you know, you can't just call anybody when you're newly retired. Well, he was the only person who was interested in my ideas at the time. So, <laughs> so your your fa your father's field was in my father uh, was an employee benefit consultant, and I, see, I don't know whether you know any of his history. Not but, really. Um, he, um, he was a lawyer, tax, tax attorney, uh, went to the University of Michigan, and um, somehow he got interested a lot in uh, pension type of finance. And in 1952, he published an article in the Harvard Business Review, which basically was the um, explanation of a variable annuity, when a variable annuity was very, very new. And um, he always told me that there was one problem in figuring that out, he and Bill Greeno of uh, TIA Craft would have coffee going back and forth. And he told me there was something I couldn't figure out and I didn't know enough to ask what it was. But when I was about 12, he said, this is something you really should know. And he told me all about unit accounting. And I thought, oh, <laughs> that's very interesting. But um, in his article, he, he told me that he called on Mr. Fisher and got an answer, but I, in his article, he references um, an actuary named Hennington who had already worked out how to do um, having trust units instead of dollars. And that op opened the way and, um, for exactly how TIA is doing it. Um, and then 
much later on, I think when he was retired, he did more research and found out in 1939, there was another actuary who had laid out the whole thing. So just goes to show very variable annuities, like any other new idea, there's a lot of strains going through it. Yes, exactly right. But what was his main profession? Um, well, in, in 1952, he had this idea and he published it and then he went out on his own. He had been a salaried um, in-house counsel. And um, he he put in uh, he put in variable annuities in several companies. Long Island Lighting was was one of them, and then it didn't go well. So then he had a uh, a period when you know there are four kids in the house and no income, and he made an appointment with Peter Drucker, and it described who he was. And Peter Drucker said you should be an employee benefits consultant and you should go to Johnson Higgins, and that's what he did. And and then he had a you know, blooming career as a employee benefits consultant. Like he put in the first profit sharing plan for McKinsey and you know did all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and so he and I have a lot in, in common. So he obviously was a you know, big influence on me. So as V, the way I met you was I was on the national board for the Financial Planning Association. Oh, actually I was um, on my way to being introduced to that. Um, and someone called up and said, we need someone to uh, run the investment part of the national conference. And I said, whoa, that sounds like a big job. And they said, no problem. You know, headquarters does all the administrative work and there's a committee. And then I found out, no, there's no committee. There's no help. <laughs> so I was supposed to identify the topics, the speakers, call the speakers. They wanted me to negotiate with the speakers and then, you know, handle all the log logistics. And at the same time, Zvi, your article and Bob Merton's article came out in the Financial Analyst Journal. And I actually was at my parents' house when I read it. And I read it and thought, no one has ever said this before. It's basically life cycle investing. And I thought, this is right. And our field has never heard of it. And I saw it was you and I, I knew you were a very nice young man. <laughs> so I called you and you took my call and I said, would you uh, speak? And you said, yes. Um, and then you and I had several, uh, for a while there, we were a duo in the financial planning national le lecture circuit and, and made a big difference. And we um, co-authored uh, at least one article. Yeah. So um, I'm very grateful to you, Zvi. You're, you know, one of your questions, I think, is uh, and mentors. In, in terms of my profession, you were my key mentor because I, I had no point of view, just like our industry doesn't, of how to think about you know, how does, how should an individual think about financial security? But uh, not only did you have the idea, but you were very generous in sharing it. And that, that first opinion, you, you were my uh, entree, you know, my, to the world of professional financial planners. I remember when uh, I told you some of the things that financial planners thought, and you said, you're kidding. <laughs> no, not only that, but I did not expect to get such a hostile reception. Yeah. To my ideas, because they they wanted to hear what uh, what uh, Siegel was saying, you know, or, stocks for the that. long run. They didn't they didn't want to hear my stuff. Well, and, one, one time I, I made a keynote address at NorCal, which is one of the, you know, the big conferences of financial planning. And uh, I basically just said our ideas, which are very simple. And half the group said, whoa, this is great, but, you know, a little bit you know, too far out there, you know, good to know. And then the other half was um, actively hostile. In fact, my yeah. colleagues there came and stood with me for the, you know, when people came up. So it people don't like it when a new paradigm comes in. No, especially when they've been preaching the old paradigm. Right. They, they feel very threatened. I wondered what it was like in the medical field, because I think there are a lot of comparisons with financial advising in the medical field and, and how it's developed. And I wondered what it would have been like if you were a mid-career physician when people told you you had to wash your hands in between patients um, exactly. and that maybe you had been killing people. Um, it, it, I mean, it's hard for a mid-career professional to take in a new idea. It really is. It really is. And what we're discovering is that that may be true of the population in general. Yeah. Look at Trump's popularity. Yeah. Well, um, at least you weren't canceled. Uh, geez, so. <laughs> right. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, they tried, though. <laughs> but, but now here's where, here's, where, here's where Paula 
uh, and I really hit upon a great idea. She invited me to speak at another conference. I think it was in Canada. Uh, this and, was the NAPFA National Conference. And yeah. I said, why don't you arrange a debate between me and Jeremy Siegel? Yeah. Stocks for the long run. Now that was a big hit. That was a home run. Uh, yeah. Well, let's let's go back to your career. Paul. Wait, 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 one thing. Who won the debate? <laughs> Who won that debate hands down? <laughs> I think you did speak. <laughs> I think so too. Well, Jeremy Siegel said in that debate that he thought that uh, an inflation index annuity is the proper base case. I know. He wound up agreeing with me. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's go back to Paula's how she got into her career, partly through the influence of her father. But how about your higher education? Yeah. Well, she started out in in healthcare. Tell us that yeah. story. Um, well, I majored in economics at, at Princeton, and uh, that was fabulous. And I thought after that I would like to go into healthcare. I had a very naive view that in the uh, in the hospital everyone is there, and I. I don't like dealing with one strata of a, a group. I like to know everything that's going on. And so um, I worked for Roosevelt Hospital um, and before I went to Harvard School of Public Health for a master's degree in health policy and management, which was you know, okay and interesting, but I found out I don't wanna be in healthcare. It's, um, hospital administration was corporate stuff and Medicare regulations and you know, managing physicians. I'm married to a physician, but I didn't wanna manage them. Um, so I really, um, didn't know, you know, what I wanted to do. I went to, um, I was in Boston for a while. I worked for Bank of Boston on the investment side. And there I learned it was very interesting, but I didn't think I could have a family and be a woman in banking in that era. It, it was unpleasant and there wasn't going to be any way forward unless I, well, you all know that the women who did the trailblazers and in accounting and finance moved their way. There aren't very many in that generation who were married and had kids. And that, that was something that was very important to me. And then my husband was a resident um, uh, at, at Harvard. And he was going to take a decrease in pay um, to go from being a resident to going into the lab. So we needed money to make it through the next year. And he did a locum tenens with some uh, colleagues in Odessa, Texas. And we thought we would go there for six weeks to make enough money to get through his uh, fellowship time. And we ended up staying six years because it just was wonderful. Um, uh, it was a major trauma hospital. So from his perspective, he was saying, I might be allowed to watch some of these um, uh, big deal operations as an anesthesiologist, you know, in the second or third row. But here I am the anesthesiologist and I'm doing three a day and I love it. Um, and I, um, I was still quite wandering around the dark about what I wanted to do, but um, we had a child and I, um, I believed in childcare. And so I started a preschool there, which is very new in, in Odessa. The only daycares were where the maids would send their children so they could work for the rich people. There weren't any preschools, but um, we'd had access to a beautiful preschool in Wellesley. So I hired a couple of those teachers to just tell me we had like six sessions where they said, how do you set up a room? What do you expect from a teacher? How do you support the teacher? And we go, what do you want from the teacher? Um, what are the different stages for an infant through like four years old? Because that's what we were doing. And how do you manage the parents? And so when we got to Odessa, I, I had no idea that this was new, but I, I called up all the physicians' wives, because it was that kind of a town, and told them I'm starting a preschool, and then one or two were kind of interested, and then it became sort of a, a society thing to do. And that preschool lasted long after we, we were there. Um, and so that was um, a very uh, agreeable entrepreneurial endeavor. So when we was Texas, it big? Was it a big cultural uh, shift to go from uh, yes. Cambridge, Massachusetts to- I was coming Odessa, from Texas. East Coast, banking, brittle feminism, you know, suits it, you know, with a little bow tie, no makeup, and going down to Texas Medical Society and where, you know, we socialized with, with the surgeons because they were my husband's customers. And we would go down to, um, we'd 
fly down to Dallas for shopping trips and things like that. It was, it was totally, it was, it, it was a big culture shock for me and for, for people who were meeting us, but we made very good friends. In fact, two of the women there, um, we had the type of friendship you do when you have babies together. But ever since I left Texas, every year we've gone on a trip, uh, a weekend trip, even when the kids were little. Uh, and now we're, we're still doing it. So that those, those friendships are very, very important. Wonderful, wonderful. So how, been, how did you then go from childcare we, to, uh, or preschool to? Uh, well, during that uh, time I, I was running the uh, preschool and I did my husband's billing office, but I needed something for me intellectually. And my brother had been doing a consulting project doing artificial intelligence for financial planning. And he told me about this new field. He said, this is perfect for you. So during those years, I got the CFP and the CFA. Um, and that's what I did during, during the day. For CFP, I, let's translate. That's Certified Financial Planner. Yeah. And uh, CFA is Chartered Financial Analyst, which right. is a good deal harder <laughs> certification. Yeah. The CFP is... Um, it's, it's basically the certificate from a trade organization, but it's the only organization that to the extent there's a body of knowledge in financial planning, it's kind of centered there. And then, uh, so, and, and now if you wanna be in financial planning, you have to have that. Um, and um, the Charter Financial Analyst, I'm very proud of, very um, substantive material and um, a, a, you know, a lifelong relationship for learning. Um, and, it's, you were, and, it, and it's three three exams over three years, mm -hmm. and they're difficult. The yeah. pass rate for the first level is less than fifty percent, way less. Yeah. Than it's gotten a lot more technical. Um, when I took it, they uh, options were first introduced, um, and then it's gotten much much uh, uh, more sub substantive and more quantitative in the same way financial planning became quantitative, but um, uh, it, it was, it, it's a really good organization. So which, which one? On the CFA, the CFA Institute. Um, I hope right. their global conferences come back because before COVID I was uh, going to them. There. Right, there and, and how would you, now the financial planning community has something called NAPFA. Yes. Um, which is, I forget um, what this is. National stands. Association for Personal Financial Advisors. And um, when I started financial planning, because when we left Texas, I came back and um, I went into financial planning. I opened my own firm in, in Milwaukee. And um, I very quickly got drawn into NAPFA and I'm so grateful because I caught a wave that was just right for me. Um, NAPFA was the advocacy group that brought fee-only planning to, to life. Um, but we were the group that said, um, people want advice, not product, and people will pay for advice. And that was laughable from the brokerage community until we started being successful. And now the brokerage community is, you can't tell the difference between their office and, and our offices. Um, at that point, NAPFA had, um, the first cohort of NAFA people starved, but they were the people who, as all strong social movements happened, they were the ones who got in the room and talked about what they cared about and what they wanted to do it. And that, that's how all big change comes from. It's just from the small people talking about what they care about. And, and let's explain that they were fee only, which meant they did not get commissions from mm -hmm. you know investment firms, and others who are trying to right. but We're not basically broken. may not may not represent your the client's best interest. Yeah, we we sell advice, and the only compensation comes from the client. Um, and so when I joined NAPFA, it was just it just beyond that first raw you know the, the people who plowed the ground initially to the people who are beginning to lift it up into a movement. And yeah. I uh, very quickly got involved, like uh, uh, helping to run conferences, and I served on the national board at a time where the national board was having big fights about, um, uh, you know, can we have, um, can an FM member accept a referral? You can't pay for a referral, but you know, can you receive one? And, and you know, what, 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 what is an ethical uh, way, way to be? 
And we also expanded the, the notion that financial planning is not just about the portfolio, it's more broad. And the CFP was doing the same thing at the same time, but the CFP is funded by the whole industry, which is dominated by the, by the brokerage firms. And, and there was the issue of, are you a fiduciary or not? Yeah, right. And, and NAFPA said you have to be a fiduciary. Fiduciary meaning you put the client's interest first. Right. Yeah. Oh, just to bring it down to a little human level, uh, can you tell us some of your early periods when you were actually advising families or individuals? Um, how did it sort of strike you? Did you just sort of match, you know, you, you're obviously a compelling person to talk with, but how did that uh, early experience uh, shape uh, how you looked at things? First, of all, I was very lucky that um, there was ease of entry. Um, I opened my business in 1992 in Milwaukee and I had clients before I had an office. Wow. Um, because if you said, I, I don't work for a brokerage firm and, and I will give you advice and I will charge you an hourly rate, that was a very appealing proposition. Um, at this, so one, my firm is very distinctive in that I was a fiduciary and proud of it. And um, then at the same time, I had read about dimensional fund advisors. There was a Forbes article where Dan Wheeler described it. And I read that and, and thought index funds make a lot of sense. And so I called him up and um, he, at that point you had to be I guess you still do have to be approved to be in DFA, but I, I think that was pretty loose uh, entree. But um, he and his team offered a lot of uh, mentoring. So in my firm, I distinctive from what people have been used to, I was a fiduciary offering, offering index funds and um, at very low rates. And I was talking to people about their whole financial picture. Because if you think about financial planning, it came out of the brokerage firm. So it was only about the portfolio. And the idea was grow the portfolio as big as it can be. And then with life cycle investing, it was, wait a minute, how about what's the goal for the portfolio and what is appropriate funding uh, for the portfolio? And then at the same time building and, and how do you how do you protect your human capital? And you know, and that brings in an insurance um, and also career development. Uh, and then um, the folks out in positive psychology were talking about how, uh, what happens when someone goes through change and what makes positive change. So there's a, a section of psychology called the, uh, positive psychology, which is build on strengths. Don't think about what's wrong and let's try to fix what's wrong, but you know, find the strengths and build on them. So when I started out, um, it was very new to have an Excel spreadsheet. Um, that, that was new. We didn't have any performance reporting. Um, uh, and then being a fiduciary was new. Index funds were new. Comprehensive was new. Lower rates were new. And then it just exploded um, from that. Um, and you were independent. Uh, Hogan Financial was mm -hmm. yeah. the name of the firm. And, uh, now you've evolved yep. to working for somebody else. Yeah, that was a big change. Um, th there's a big change in our in industry going on. Um, uh, in the peak of Hogan Financial, where we were really flourishing, we had the products to implement lifecycle investing. And um, it was r really um, a beautiful opportunity to really talk about someone's whole financial picture and thinking, what's your human capital? How can we help that flourish? And then how do we, to get your financial capital and tailor it to that? And by the way- I, I should point out that we were a team, you and I, we spoke at a couple of conventions and, and we got Kelly Euler involved as well. Yep. Yeah, you, you made the connection for Kelly. Uh, Kelly's um, a firm um, to, with NAPFA and, and then that created a path and helped boost it up um, inflation indexed uh, annuities being able to be available to, to retail. And now, now they're off the market. Um, why? Yeah, uh, which is hard. We're trying to get it back on the market. Why, why are they off the market? Um, 
the insurance companies say there wasn't any interest, and then I think low interest makes low interest rate makes it really hard. And oh. they weren't. The, I I don't know how they would hedge their liabilities. Um, they well, were, with tips, with with treasury inflation protected securities. But when they were doing it, they were doing it with a 60-40 portfolio because it was such a small part of their portfolio they could. Yes, it just never, it did not catch on. And that's yeah. the subject for another interview. <laughs> yes. So there's this arc of um, fiduciary comprehensive, linking it with um, positive psychology, which is really is the theory of um, change. Because one thing when you're a financial advisor, you meet people people come to you when they are in a moment of personal change. And sometimes it's very overt, like post-divorce or they're widowed um, or you know, um, they have their first real job. Um, or, and sometimes it's much more subtle, but in that first interview, if you listen for it, you will find what is the personal change that, that triggered them to, to come. Um, and so knowing how to work with someone who's in the middle of transition is part of it, advising. And we don't really have any training on that, but it doesn't stop us from doing our best to help. <laughs> well, there are some gurus in the field, right? Yes. Yeah. So I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot see, from you and then from the positive psychology people, and I tried to put it together. And there was an arc there um, where, where NAPFA grew and grew and grew. And then there's some changes in the, in the industry that I think we're in a different chapter now. Uh, NAPFA does not have the voice that it that used to have. Um, uh, I went back on the board recently by invitation. And first of all, if someone late in career is being invited back to a board, that's not a, probably not a good sign of health <laughs> for the organization. <laughs> and, and it turned out to be true. So I had to resign because um, it, it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't uh, what I, I cared about. Um, but I, you, happened, you, to be said, you went from uh, being your own boss to working for someone else. Right. Um, that and, must have been a quite a change. And yes, it was. Just, uh, because at Hogan Financial, there was no difference between me and my company. I mean, that was who I, who I was. In December 2019, I sold my firm. I had a, a minority partner. He and I sold the firm to Creative Planning, which is a national uh, fiduciary firm. And um, I did that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I'm... Um, uh, I want. I didn't have an exit strategy other than selling that would be honorable for my clients and my staff and my family because um, my firm had. I didn't expect my firm to become valuable, but it. I caught a wave in it, and it did. Um, and I, it was so. It, it was hard. I did a lot of work in my head about you know I'm not going to be the owner and what does that mean and I need to really cultivate curiosity and not judgment or you know it's not going to work. But I hired an investment banker who made me once again believe in process, even though I'm not wired to think about process. Um, and she presented about, I don't know, three dozen firms. And I said, well, these dozen, we don't even have to talk to. And then there are about two dozen left. We did some phone interviews. And then we got down to about, about a dozen firms that they were interested in me. I was interested in talking to them. And I went to visit. Thank God it was before COVID because it, it was just, I mean, it was the most fun I had in a long time uh, professionally because I would talk with the top guys and these are the top firms in investment management and financial planning. And then I talked to the middle management, but I would walk through their back offices. So you really got a sense of what's the character of the firm. And the ones where we went to more interviews, we got, you know, got down to a subset, there were like two or three interviews, just the way when you're hiring an employee, you, don't, you, you always have multiple interviews. So I feel like I really got a window into the field and the investment banker knew about firms I, I didn't know anything about. But from that process, aside from it being fun um, and, and just really interesting, I had the confidence I was selling to the right firm uh, because um, like healthcare, financial planning is scaling, um, but the firms differ in their internal culture about whether they really are fiduciary, whether they really are you know, planning forward. So um, at Creative Planning, I saw that human capital was just flourishing. There's, um, there's something really good going on in terms of, uh, of their staff. And I experienced, now that we've been with them for a couple of years, I didn't think I would last beyond a year. I'd, I'd never been a successful employee. 
Um, but after the transition, I'm still having a good time and my role is suiting, suited to me and the guys who I was working with, I always have just tremendous respect and affection for them, but they have bloomed in this environment. And I've seen you know, the same thing at headquarters. So- What is your role? The, um, I'm now in a role where I'm more, um, uh, I don't, I don't have ownership responsibilities and I don't, um, I don't have to run the to-do list about does someone take their RMD, uh, but I'm there for client RMD meetings. means required oh. minimum distribution. Sorry. And that's, <laughs> and that's a, you know, an important function of financial advisor to yeah. all make the, all sure the that, yeah, make sure that the clients are taking the required minimum distribution when they reach retirement age. Exactly. Thank you. Um, so I don't I don't keep track of those nitty gritty details anymore. But I'm um, uh, in in client meetings for strategy to figure out what's going on, um, figuring things out in a in a collaborative way, and um, and mentoring. And so what I've tried to be is I don't want to be the founder from hell about oh when we were at Hogan Financial we always did it that way. So what I've said to the the guys that I work with, and uh, I say guys because they're the two of the people on my team are are, are men. Um, tell me what you want me to do, and tell me what you don't want to do, and I, I do my best to do that. And then, as long as I and, and you've kept you've kept your old clients, hundred uh, percent. Wow. Yeah, and we have grown phenomenally. That's with, terrific. In COVID, with no advertising, because my website went dark and. And uh, our names didn't even go up until uh, a recent uh, refresh of the creative planning. So it's all by word of mouth uh, yeah. recommendations. And and what I found was, which is appropriate, a lot of people said, you know, we love you, Paula, but we didn't know what would happen next. And now we know um, Clinton Thomas, the guys on my team are phenomenal and they're backed up. And so, yes, please work with everyone in our family. Um, Oh, and then you hear some colleagues. And so it's been really fun. So I'm in a role now where I'm, I'm it's playing to my gifts and the amount of stress that, that I wanted to do. Well, also when you had your own firm, you were pretty ambitious about uh, writing articles and uh, newsletter and all of that stuff. I love I guess, to write. Yeah. Um, and what I, what I found is I, I was learning a lot uh, mainly from dipping beyond financial planning, like from Zvi to all the life cycle world and through the psychologists, through the you know, personal transitions. To, um, and then there's always tax planning. Uh, but I found the best way for me to learn was to put it together and write about it. And, and, uh, and I developed a voice that appealed to clients. Um, so so are, you doing, are you doing that now as part of your... Um, I'm not writing, I'm in an in-between space right now because as an employee of creative writing, I'm not going to start writing about some of the things I did before. And I don't know whether I have a book in me or whether I should be doing something totally different. And um, uh, I've had a, we had a couple of tough family situations this year where uh, in financial planning, you, you, the, the phrase is, this will make me a better financial advisor. Um, my, my brother was widowed and he doesn't have kids. My other brother and I were the support. And then my daughter had a, 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 a child with a premature birth and, and potentially profound problems. So who knew that at Harvard, there is a neonatal stroke team that will come to your bedside and debate in front of you. Um, but um, my brother's doing well. Um, Charlie, our grandson is flourishing, but we didn't know in either case, you know, how it would go. So I've been thinking a lot, of, I, I'm, and I'm still working, so I'm not really retired. So I don't, I, I don't know what comes, comes next. One thing I've been thinking about is I, I have a gift, and what I really like is uh, going into situations and just finding out what's going on. I mean, that's what being a good financial advisor is um, about. And when I look back on things that I really enjoyed, um, so for example, when I was at school public health, my um, one of my jobs as a graduate student, I was hired by the CEO, uh, Mitch Rapkin at, at the at Beth Israel Hospital. And he gave me a job to, uh, he, he wanted to find out something that was going on that required um, interviewing the head of every department. 
And um, I did that and learned a lot about the hospital. And in doing it, I found out something he didn't know about, but wanted to know about. And I think the chair chairman thought that I'd been sent out to find to let them vent about that. And so I carried uh, both stories back. But that was that was my dream of being in the hospital, you know, and seeing everything that's that's going on. Well, listen, Paul, it occurs to me that you may want to join our team. The I would ideas, love to. ideas and lives. Let's <laughs> think about it. I yeah, would love to. Yeah, you can. We've we've enjoyed interviewing people as well. So uh, and and some of the people we've interviewed, like uh, uh, Tamar Jacoby, has participated as a an interviewer. Yeah. So it's good. there you go. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead. So it's so in answer to your question, I'm still operating as a financial advisor by my values. Um, uh, I don't agree with everything in, in, in investment approach with creative planning, but reasonable people differ and um, you know, it's not a perfect world. Um, and you don't want to go into politics? No, <laughs> but I wish good people would. We need good leaders, but we also need good followers. So I might be a good follower. All right. Okay. I, I, am, I do have my ear to the ground about what is the small group that was like NAPFA that I, I do agree that the big ideas that make positive change come from when small people, people get together in small groups and talk about what they care about. Um, yeah. So oddly enough, earlier this year, I was on jury duty and I was thinking, okay, of course I'm gonna say yes. It's, I mean, everybody needs to say yes to that, but I'm not really looking forward to it. And I got there, I thought, this is so interesting because there are people from all walks of life and we're sitting in a room and deciding how to think about something. It was very interesting. Good point. Yeah, we don't. We we used to have more of those experiences. You might have had those when you were uh, in your smaller town meeting. Uh, well, uh, let me uh, let me put wide let me, variety of people. Let me put this one uh, idea in out there. You know, Benjamin Franklin, among all of the many things that he did, he created a group of men, 12 men, called the Junto Club, H-U-N-T-O. He was only 20 years old when he did this. And they became essentially a men's group to discuss issues of interest to them, political <laughs> issues, everything. Eventually became the Philosophical Society. It still exists. Wow. So we started it, I and a couple of my friends started one in our neighborhood. You have wow. a gift for that, Sri, with the, the um, interdisciplinary conferences that you, that you gave. That's right, and, yes, right, it's sort of like that, exactly. And the, the pizza party at your house with planners, that, that should have been a, a right. every quarter right. event. Uh, we, we really should have recorded that. That was a good one. Yeah, it was. So what's the state? Now we've gone through a, a range of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, big events and uh, that, that uh, people don't always anticipate. We certainly didn't anticipate the pandemic. Um, some of the other shocks that have occurred. Are people uh, more aware that uh, you have to deal with uh, risks uh, than they used to be. Are you talking about her clients or her yeah. peers? Yeah. Um, well, clients in, and peers, yes. In the last two or three years, I, I went in business in 1992. And in the last couple of years is the first time I heard many clients who were just salt of the earth, people who, you know, they're fine. They don't need to be worried and they haven't been worried come in and say, I am just afraid for the world. I don't believe in our country. I'm worried about the country. I don't know what it'd be like for my kids. Um, and then I think all that got compounded by the isolation from COVID times. And I don't think we've rebounded from any of that. I, I think the, the destruction of civil society from the COVID isolation is very, very uh, consequential. And, and, and I, it breaks my heart that two-year-olds have been 
wearing masks and like my grandson has never seen the face of his teacher and he's learning to talk. Um, so I, I think that what I've said in client meetings is I think we're all a little bit just off our game and it's okay just to take a deep breath and slow down and re regroup. Um, I don't think anyone is really in the moment of flow right now. And what does that mean for financial planning? Um, for people who are um, impulsive, it can be, I want to lie, I want to buy a lot of Bitcoin. I want to get out of the stock market. Um, um, for people who like working at home, they don't want to go back to the office. Um, uh, it's just, there's a big, so impulsive, it might make big change in financial planning. And then other ones just a little bit cautious, a little bit harder to trust. Um, sometimes, you know, the way someone is um, perplexed, confused or depressed that you can't implement as well. Um, so it, it's not a big deal, but relative to way it used to be in financial planning, there is a shadow but um, not so much in financial planning. I think people are dealing with it. They're trying to figure it out. And it's not, um, human beings aren't meant to be isolated. And Let me ask you this, as a financial planner, uh, I guess even before COVID, you had clients geographically dispersed and you dealt with them, I don't know how, I guess over the internet, because it's, it's been a long time that you could do that, um, but has has this has uh, co you know I think now about uh, professional therapists who are doing psychotherapy right. over the internet, and I used to think that was impossible, but it's not impossible. Uh, I'm very curious about all that uh, at Hogan. We didn't uh, have any uh, Zoom. I had a, a few children of clients who were you know, in different states, but we'd see them when they came back for Christmas or something something like that. Or, or um, if they were in New York or Chicago or Boston, I'm there, um, or, or Washington, I'm, I'm there a lot. Um, but now we, we have clients all over the country and, and there's some clients that, um, that we've never met in person. And the only people who wanted to come in in the middle of COVID were the old and frail because they were so lonely. And we say, no, you can't come in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I don't, we're trying to figure out, um, first of all, I think like any company, which staff wants to come into the office and, and in the younger generation, you don't, that's not an automatic Monday through Friday. Um, and then which clients want to come in and, and how often and how, how much would, like if someone says Zoom is fine with me, should we say, well, maybe every third time we can meet in person. I, I had a, a, a thought provoking experience um, just in the last couple of weeks, a young professional couple, two high powered people in um, uh, tech and medicine came in for a, uh, their first in-person meeting. They've been meeting by Zoom. And afterwards they said, oh, it's so nice to meet in person. I feel like we got so much more done. And I thought of all the people on the planet, these people would have been fine with Zoom. And I, so I don't know what we're missing. I, I think we have to do some exploration. Yeah. Well, I think we're missing some of the, just the informal human interactions that uh, happen when you're with another person. And uh, I, I, you know, having just come back from abroad and visiting my daughter and uh, grandson, um, it's uh, a lot different to be in person than yeah. uh, on FaceTime or Zoom. Um, but if you can't do a person better than phone, maybe not better than letters. I, I don't know. It's, a, it's absolutely, it's absolutely better than, than that. Um, better than Martin, letters than that. People didn't write so many. So yeah, <laughs> Whereas, in, in the old days they did. Um, yeah. in, in, in March of 220, we just went uh, um, uh, remote abruptly. And I'd say half of our client base at that point, we had over 100 clients had never used Zoom. So we taught about half of our client base to use Zoom. And I wish mm -hmm. I had known and had the ability to take the pictures because 
for sometimes it, it took a while, like 15 or 20 minutes, and they'd be fooling around and, you know, maybe they get the picture, but not the audio and, and they'd be, you know, looking over here, you know, you look at the camera. Um, but the picture that I wish I could have, like in a flip book, um, are especially the older couples who, at the moment when they could hear and see us and go both way, the look on their face is just pure joy and surprise and like, ah, oh, you know, the world is okay. It's so beautiful. And that would happen over and over and over and over again. So right. on the one hand, it was really hard to do that, but it was so beautiful to see the joy and also information about how lonely people were. Yeah, I, I'm one of those people who think that on balance, uh, this technology is a huge plus. Yes. A I huge agree. plus in, in just about every respect. Uh, I know that I if personally have all of a sudden renewed relationships that had basically, I'd lost track of people and I'd find them and we do FaceTime or Zoom and it's, it's like old times. Yeah. One of the blessings when my uh, brother was widowed is my other brother and I um, one have a lot of contact with him. So first of all, it was almost daily contact, but now we're continuing to do um, every Sunday night calls, which go for an hour, hour and a half. And it's very restorative to all of us. Exactly. And that wouldn't happen otherwise. No, it wouldn't. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid it's very difficult for economists to count that in our GDP in the same way that, <laughs> that, that it brings value uh, uh, to people. Um, but it is something that I think, uh, you know, we're now taking for granted even. And um, it's, it's something that, of course, those of us that grew up in another time uh, don't really take it for granted. So no. uh, it's... Um, uh, I once, I once did an experiment in my economics class um, that, you know, others have done. I wasn't original when I uh, asked them, uh, and this was maybe eight years ago, uh, and I asked them, uh, well, would you rather have the prices of 1970 um, with only the goods that were available in 1970, only oh, the healthcare that was available, only the iPhone, only the technology that was available, no personal computers, no iPhones, and uh, but things cost a lot less and you get the same dollar amount of money. And almost universally, they said, oh no, we couldn't live without uh, the, uh, the goods and services that are available today that weren't available then, and uh, that that they were willing to pay the higher costs of the other things in order to have those goods that weren't available uh, when we grew up. Because they're natives to that yeah. culture. Yeah. Yeah. See, Bob Lerman and I are essentially believers in positive psychology. <laughs> I can tell. I can the tell. glass is half full. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. I think we have to sign off. Well, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Well, I appreciate it. It's, uh, it was, it's delightful to have you, Paula. It's delightful to know you. And uh, I've, I've, I've learned a lot more than Svee, probably, because I wasn't really aware of these things. My only uh, thought is that uh, we're going to have to try to create apprenticeships in some of that, in some of these fields so that people can learn by doing uh, as well as. Yeah, we uh, should say academic. that Bob, Bob's uh, expertise and passion as an economist is apprenticeship programs as, as a way of building human capital. I like that. Yes. Um, but it, one, one thing that it, you, a topic for conversation about that would be wh who are the professionals in our society now? And 
Um, and, and why is that? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, Very thanks so much, Paula. We, we okay. really appreciate it. And, and uh, uh, we have a traditional uh, sign off, which I'm not sure you'll understand because it's Yiddish. Okay. Zai gesund. Zai gesund. Healthy? Well, gesund is healthy, yes. But it means be well or actually goodbye. Zai gesund. <laughs> <The con> <laughs> <Zai gesund. laughs> okay, thanks again. Bye. Bye.